positive lambda doesn't exist non-perturbatively. One reason for this is that it doesn't appear possible with positive lambda to define precise observables. So there aren't local operators in quantum gravity in general because the fluctuations in space-time mean that the x that would appear as the argument of a local operator, 5x, isn't gauge invariant. So observables in quantum gravity always have to do with some consideration of the asymptotic behavior. And with positive cosmological constant, there's nothing really nice. I'm not sure it's true that, um, OK, a possible physical interpretation is that a world with positive cosmological constant, such as perhaps the real universe, is always unstable. If that's so, then it would not make sense as an exact theory in its own right, but would have to be studied as part of a larger system, like an unstable particle, like a W boson, which precisely because it's unstable, only makes sense in the context of a bigger theory. I don't know whether that's the right interpretation, but in any event, since I don't know any precise observables, I can't try to solve 2 plus 1 dimensional gravity with positive lambda, since I wouldn't know what to try to compute. I can't say it definitely doesn't make sense. I only can say that nobody has convincingly explained what you should aim to compute, and thus what it would mean to solve it. And since we don't know what it would, would mean to solve it, we won't try. This is an advance compared to 20 years ago. 20 years ago, the status of quantum gravity was equally murky for positive or negative cosmological constant. And nobody would have said I'm going to focus on the negative case because the meaning is clear cut. And I'll leave aside the positive case because its meaning is murky. So there has been some progress. Now, of course, zero cosmological constant is the borderline. And above two plus one dimensions, it has a meaningful observable, which is the S matrix. That doesn't really work in two plus one dimensions. There are no gravitational waves. So without matter fields, in pure gravity, there, is, well, there also are no black holes when the cosmological constant is zero. So there's nothing that could be scattered, and therefore there's no S matrix. And again, there's no clear picture of what you would mean by trying to solve the theory. So we'll leave aside the case of zero cosmological constant. But with negative cosmological constant, we know exactly what we want to do. We want to describe the dual conformal field theory. It captures the asymptotic information analogous to the S matrix when lambda is zero, but it's much, much richer than the S matrix. The S matrix is a kind of poor cousin. Not only does the dual conformal field theory make sense in two plus one dimensions, but two plus one dimensions is the case for some of the richest known examples. And one of the precursors of the ABS CFT correspondence was the work of Brown and Hinault on two plus one dimensional gravity. They consider two plus one dimensional gravity perhaps with additional matter fields. In their analysis, it isn't important to have pure gravity. And they showed that it has an action of a left and right moving pair of their SR algebras with C left and C right given by their formula. Well, invariance under the Verisola algebra is part of the structure of conformal field theory, but con there's much more to conformal field theory. So from a modern point of view, what they're describing is part of the correspondence of the bulk theory with the conformal field theory on the boundary. So we can simply say what it means to solve the theory for negative lambda what it means to solve it is to find the dual conformal field theory. And to repeat, we focus on the case where lambda is negative, because that's the only case in which we know what it would mean to solve the theory. Now, this formulation makes obvious a statement that, from a classical point of view, looks rather surprising. When we look at the classical action, it appears that L which is the cosmological constant, essentially, in Planck units, is a free parameter. But the formula for the central charge shows that this must be wrong. According to the Zamologic of C theorem, in any continuously variable family of conformal field theories in 1 plus 1 dimensions, the central charge C is a constant. Hence, it cannot depend on a variable parameter such as L over G. It must be that 2 plus 1 dimensional quantum gravity makes sense 
at most only for certain values of L over J. Of course, there's an important technical assumption in them logic of theorem. The theory must have a normalizable and SL2 invariant ground state. This assumption is valid in 2 plus 1 dimensional gravity, with anti Sitter space being the classical approximation to the relevant quantum state. Now, incidentally, the remark that L over G can't be continuously varied isn't special to pure gravity. It holds in any theory of 2 plus 1 dimensional gravity plus matter that leads to an anti Sitter vacuum. For example, in the string theory models whose CFT duals are known, L over G is expressed in terms of integer valued fluxes, which gives a direct explanation of why it can't be continuously varied. It's determined in terms of integers. So we're only going to aim to solve the theory for negative cosmological constant, and even then only for certain values of L over G. But what are the right values? Actually, until here, I think everything I said is true. It's past this point that uh, I don't have, it's, well, it's past this point why I offer no assurances. Well, I don't have any honest way to determine the right values of L over G, but there's a simple picture that gives us a plausible heuristic way to calculate L over G, and it turns out that it gives interesting values. We're just going to take at face value the gauge theory description of 2 plus 1 dimensional gravity, although we don't really know why we should do this, since we don't trust it non-perturbatively since it doesn't describe the black holes, as far as I understand. Now, in doing this, though, we'll generalize the theory a little bit. In addition to L over G, there's a second dimensionless parameter, since you can add to the action a multiple of the churn Simons invariant of the spin connection, where here K is an integer for topological reasons. So quantum, our problem of pure gravity depends on two parameters, L over G and K. And we're trying to solve a constantly trivial theory that depends on two parameters. And we understand that the second parameter is an integer. That has to do with well, classical considerations. The churn simons action is multi-valued. And in quantum mechanics, the action has to be defined modulo 2 pi. And when you implement that, the 4 pi here was chosen, so that if k is an integer, then the action is defined mod 2 pi. Well, so k is a churn simon coupling, but in the gauge theory approach to gravity, L over G is a churn simon coupling also. So we already understand that K is quantized, and we're just going to quantize L over G by interpreting it as another churn simons coupling, just like K. So remember, in the gauge theory interpretation, the gauge group was SO2 too. But in four dimensions, well, this 2 is really the number of space dimensions. So in 3 plus 1 dimensions, it would have been SO3 too. Precisely because there are two space dimensions, we have the fact that SO22 is a product of two SO21s. And the two SO21 gauge fields, I'll call them A plus and minus, or omega plus or minus E. And the action is the sum of two churn simons actions, one for A minus and one for A plus. And if we take the gauge theory description at phase value, then both K left and K right are integer values for topological reasons. To make sure that the action is well-defined mod 2 pi, uh, k left and k right must be integers. Now, there's something funny happening here, because in general relativity, it seems that the Einstein-Hilbert action is well-defined, not just well-defined mod 2 pi. By going to gauge theory, we're allowing additional non-classical configurations where the fear bind isn't invertible. And in that bigger world, the Einstein-Hilbert action is not well-defined as a real number. It's well to find mod 2 pi if we normalize it properly. So what we've done to determine the right values of L over J, I can't guarantee it's correct, but what we've 